Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all and all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson cleansing power are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you fully trusting in his grace this hour are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed, are you washed in the blood in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are you garments Spotless are they white as snow Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Washed in the blood of the Lamb There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb Are you washed, Are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotless, are they white as are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb.
Good morning and welcome everyone. Great to be with you uh, wherever you are today. When I record these messages, I've been picturing you in your living room, but because of technology, you could be just about anywhere watching this and that's that's pretty cool. Uh, so where, whenever you are seeing this and wherever you're seeing this, so glad that it's reaching you and I trust that it will be a benefit to you in your walk with the Lord and your life in Christ. As many as you, as many of you know, uh, we sent out a survey this past week looking for your perspective on reopening. And a big thank you to all those who filled that out. About half of you that received that did actually did that. Uh, but there's still time for the rest of you um, uh, to fill that out, and we would certainly love to, to, to hear from you. If you didn't receive that survey and you would like to, just contact the church using email, and we'll make sure that we uh, get it to you. Uh, before looking at another psalm today, I just want to again thank uh, Roxy and Cheryl, and more recently, Daughters of the King, uh, for providing music and song each week. I know uh, that uh, nothing actually replaces uh, being together and worshiping in song, uh, but I so appreciate the ministry that is being offered uh, through these uh, committed servants. And I would encourage you as well to reach out to them uh, with a word of gratitude uh, for their service uh, to us. Uh, we're not doing this alone. Uh, every gift that we offer to another is a gift that God can use for the benefit of that other, but also uh, for God's glory. So thank you, ladies, uh, for the good work you're doing. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace and your kindness and your mercies that are truly new every morning. We ask on this day that we would uh, be open to receiving what your spirit has for us. I pray, Lord, that the encouragement and strength and blessing and healing that is ours in Christ Jesus would come to us as we have decided to meet together to hear your word and to be open to what you want to do. So, Lord, make us willing to be willing uh, to hear from you and to, be, uh, to allow your spirit to work in our lives. We pray for those in the midst of, of grief, those who are struggling, Lord, an added measure of your blessing over their lives. It's a privilege to hold them up to you. Uh, be with those who are recovering from, from illness. Be with those who are home from hospital. Uh, be, those, be with those who are anxious about uh, the state of the world that we are in. Lord, I pray that that which is not of you would be removed and that which is of you, peace, love, and joy in the Holy Ghost would replace that. And Lord, that they would know that they would know that they are loved and secure in you. Lord, we thank you for this 
wonderful opportunity to be together to hear your word. And I pray strength and grace on each one today. Thank you for it. In Christ's name, amen. Well, today I want to look at a psalm uh, that characterizes a number of psalms. It shares the same themes and much of the language of so many others. And it's Psalm 6, you can turn there now. And really, it's a prayer uh, for help. I think if you were to evaluate our praying as a church, uh, and until the summer break, we were getting together online uh, on Wednesdays, and we are still doing that on uh, Sunday mornings, I'd have to say that that number one prayer, not the only prayer, but the number one prayer in this entire season of COVID-19 has been the prayer for help. Help this person, help that person deal with this challenge or, or that circumstance. Help us to know how we should respond to these guidelines and these uh, challenges all around us. Help us sort out how we're feeling about all of these things. Uh, help those who are making decisions over us and help those uh, frontline workers who are providing care. Help the marginalized. Help those who are uh, isolated because of all this. Help, help, help. Uh, it's really been the bulk of our praying in this season. And that shouldn't surprise us really because uh, we've never faced anything like this before. So it's not unreasonable that the content of our prayers uh, would reflect that prayer of course, is much more than just asking for help, but it is not lessened by it. God knows that we need help. He is, and he is more than willing to hear and answer our cry for it. God is not put off by the struggles in our lives. In fact, he invites us to come to him. Uh, Peter instructs us to cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. The writer of Hebrew speaking about, uh, Hebrews speaking about uh, Jesus tells us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, uh, meaning that Jesus understands us, he gets us, he sympathizes with our weakness. And, and if he cares for us and indeed does sympathize with us, it can only mean that he welcomes our cry for help. The writer of Psalm 6 must have known these truths uh, as well, because as you will see, he is unapologetic in making his needs uh, known and unreserved in his expression of them. Let's read it uh, together. The Psalm of David. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, and deliver me, save me, because of your unfailing love. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? I am worn out from groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil. For the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and dismayed. They will, be, they will turn back in sudden disgrace. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. To help us understand what uh, and how the psalmist is praying for help, uh, it, would benefit, it would benefit us to think uh, of this as a poem with uh, three sections or three uh, stanzas. The first section is verse one to three. You can follow along in your Bibles. And here, uh, the psalmist is expressing the profound 
tension that is present in his understanding of what God is up to in his life. Have you ever wondered, maybe privately or even out loud, God, what are you up to? I don't understand what you are doing. Why is this happening to me and why is it happening to my loved ones? Lord, if this is your plan for me, I don't want it. Have you ever thought such thoughts? I'm sure you have. I'm sure that this global pandemic has pushed those questions and those thoughts to the, to the front of your mind. The writer of this psalm is in the exact same place by expressing, expressing the tension of trying to understand what God is up to. He does this in a couple of ways. First, by asking God not to rebuke him in his anger or discipline him, him in his wrath. He is essentially saying, God, I don't like what you're up to. Talk about being honest with the Lord. It really is a request for God not to be involved in his life in that way. I don't want your rebuke. I don't want your discipline. You know, sometimes a rebuke and discipline come as a result of our sin. That's a popular Old Testament idea that sometimes is true, that if there is sickness or infirmity of, or, and of any kind, it is because you have, have done something wrong or offended God. And so it, it results in some form of, of judgment. But that's not always the case. Not all sickness or infirmity is caused by sin. The Bible also uh, affirms the fact that sometimes trials, sometimes challenges, are part of God's plan to shape our character and grow our relationship of faith uh, with him. But the psalmist doesn't know which of those is true for him. Is God acting to, uh, toward him as a judge or is he acting toward him as a teacher that he might learn something? But either way, the psalmist is not enjoying the experience of whether it's judgment or whether it's discipline. And I would suggest that neither any of us does as well. You know, I always find it ironic that Christians and non-Christians alike all want God to do something about evil in this world but only if it doesn't involve them. God, solve that evil person's uh, issue over there. But if evil resides in me, please just leave me alone. That's what the psalmist is saying. I don't want judgment. I don't want discipline. And, but truly, discipline and judgment are God's gracious means by which he brings transformation in our life. But isn't it always a source of of tension for us. We don't know how to think about it. And that's what he's expressing here. He also expresses this tension by asking, how long, O Lord, how long? Not only uh, does he not want uh, uh, God to be uh, up to something in his life, uh, not only does he not understand what God's up to, he doesn't know how long it will last either. And I know that you and I have been there in the exact same place as well. Lord, I can't do this any longer. I don't want to do this any longer. How long is this going to last? But alongside these negative appeals for God to uninvolve himself in the psalmist's life and this whole question of duration of the trial are two positive appeals. Be merciful to me and heal me. This is a plea for God to do something specifically related to his character. You know, when God was establishing his covenant with Israel, he described himself this way in the book of Exodus, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, 
and sin. And in another address in Exodus, he says this, I am the Lord who heals you. The psalmist may not know what God is up to or, or why he's up to these things, but he does know what God has promised and what God is capable of doing. And we too must keep these things these truths uh, before us as well. We are going to experience in this life uh, things that result in a suffering. And for the psalmist, it appears to go right to his core. He says his bones even are in agony. And if that is physical suffering, which it sort of sounds like, that can lead to a deep anguish, physical suffering. And if it lasts for any length of time, it results in mental suffering. And so we ask the question, how long? But whatever it is, you and I must stand on the promises of God's provision. We serve a God who promises healing. And if it's not healing in this life, it's certainly healing when Jesus returns or we enter the next life. We serve a God who has the power and has offered the promise of restoration. So even though the psalmist says that God is his problem, essentially, don't rebuke me. Don't discipline me. He also knows that God is his solution. Be merciful to me. Heal me. And he's looking to the Lord for that restoration and resolution. The next stanza, verses 4 to 7, is really the heart of the, the psalmist's prayer. And it starts with a petition for God to transform the situation, to bring deliverance. He says, turn, O Lord. That's his cry. That word for turn is interesting. It can mean either repentance or it can mean restoration or change. And in this context, I think it's best to see it as a call to restoration, a call to change. Lord, he's praying, I want to be restored. Lord, I want you to change your course in dealing with me. I know that you've been at work in me in this season, but I want a new horizon. I want to go another route. Have you prayed such a prayer or something like that? Lord, I don't, I'm tired of this path. I want you to bring me onto a new path. I don't want my years to end in weakness. I want to be strong. I don't want sickness to grip me and drag me down. I want your shalom. I want your wholeness. I want your peace. Then the songwriter gives God three reasons that motivates him toward the reversal of his situation. First, he says in verse four, save me because of your unfailing love. The Hebrew word there for, um, for unfailing love is the word hased. And it's part of the covenant promise that I spoke of earlier. The Lord, the Lord abounding in hased. And there it is translated love and faithfulness. Hased appears some 250 times in the Old Testament. And it describes a love and a loyalty that inspires mercy mercy and compassion, uh, uh, compassionate behavior uh, toward another person. It's translated as unfailing love, uh, faithful love, steadfast love, or loyal love. Has said, obviously, talking about love is a relational word. And because we are in this loving relationship with God, we can lean, you and I, as the psalmist is, we can lean on that covenant promise and trust that his love can't leave us broken. His faithfulness must act and his mercy 
must be put in to action. And I know it might be a dangerous thing to say God must do anything. He's God. Who are we to say what he must do? But this is what the scripture teaches, that God's character is true and that he cannot violate that. The great I am must be himself. And that means he must extend his ro loyal love and royal love, I guess you could say, toward us. The psalmist is holding on to that reality that God will deliver him. He will save him because of his said, because of the kind of God that he is in relationship with, because of the bond that they share. And do you know, you and I share the exact same bond through Jesus Christ. We have God's loyal said over our life. It's the umbrella that covers our lives. It is the foundation under which our lives are built. We can call on him because, and we can call for restoration because of his love and his faithfulness. The second reason he gives the Lord to bring change in his life is the intense struggle that he's having. Listen again to the description of this intense uh, misery, and that's verses 6 and 7. I am worn out from groaning, he says. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch uh, with tears. My eyes grow weak uh, with sorrow. You know, often in the Bible, the, uh, the eyes are used as a metaphor for the overall health and well-being of a person in in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses, even in his elder years, is said to have eyes that have not grown dim, meaning that he is still very much filled with life and vitality. The psalmist can't say that. His light is going out. He is at the end of his resources and his strength is failing. His eyes are weak and growing darker uh, by the minute. One commentator uh, noted how many times the writer refers to, uh, to himself with reference to his body. He talks about my bones or my soul, which really is your whole self, including your body. And he talks about my eyes. Uh, and suffering uh, is really a bodily experience, isn't it? That's why he refers to his body. Suffering feels, you feel it in your body. Even if we are not suffering physically, we still feel it in our body. And those of you who are walking right now through a season of grief or, or have done that in the past when you've lost that special someone, someone important in your life, uh, you feel that grief, you feel that ache, uh, in your body. Many of us know that, that feeling very well. And that suffering in the body really does have a dehumanizing effect on us because it can easily become our focus. But if it does become our focus, then it can easily become our identity. You know, even as I grow older, I find myself talking about my aches and pains, and, I've, and I know I've heard you doing uh, the very same thing. Uh, but truly, that is not who we are. We are not the collection of our problems. We are not our diagnosis whatever that is, whether it's a self-diagnosis or one from a medical uh, a professional. What is most true of us is that we are God's beloved. And I know it's cliche to say, but truly we are the king's kids. We are not called to live out of our misery. We are meant to live out of our identity in Christ as overcomers and our destiny as redeemed and whole saints. The psalmist wants the same. Turn, Lord, turn it all around, he says. Turn me around. That's the second reason he calls on God to, to, uh, to change and to bring restoration. The third reason that he wants God to bring restoration is because of his foes. Now, we are not told who or what his foes are or what they have done. Uh, uh, but it is because of his foes that he is losing strength, it, that his life is ebbing away. And they are the reason, he says, for their suffering, for his suffering. Uh, they are the reason for his tears and his prayer 
is that God would deal with them. Now, I know I'm jumping ahead to a New Testament idea, but aren't you glad that our enemies are conquered? Aren't you glad today that uh, that greater that is uh, uh, the greater is he that is within us, meaning Christ, uh, than he that is in the world, meaning uh, the, sen- the, the Satan and his dark dark forces? Christ conquered uh, the devil through uh, the cross. Christ conquered the grave through the resurrection. Christ conquered the power of sin and darkness by offering forgiveness secured by the cross and the resurrection. And because, all the, and because of that, all the enemies of God have been made his footstool. Yes, Satan is still prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, but I tell you the truth, brothers and sisters, it doesn't need to be us. We do not need to be a part of his attack we don't, or, or part of his um, uh, conquest. We may be his prey, but we don't need to be his conquest. He is a defeated foe, and every weapon formed against us will not prosper as long as we are in this relationship with the Lord, living under his loving kindness, his said, then we are on the winning side. And the psalm is a proof of that. Listen to the reversal that takes place uh, between verse 7, which I just read, and verses 8 uh, to 10. We are not told what happens, but there must have been a space between what happened at verse 7 and crying out uh, to, for tears because of, uh, because of his foes and this reversal because we, we don't know what happened, but something surely did. He goes, you read verse 8 to 10, he goes from utter anguish because of his foes to speaking to them and telling them to depart from him, you know, sometimes we just better speak up and tell the enemy his place. He's gone from being the object of their schemes to commanding them to stop away from me, all you who do evil. What gives him the strength and the courage to say this? He tell he tells us, for the Lord has heard my weeping. He has heard my cry. For mercy, he has accepted my prayer. He's begged God to be gracious to him and now confesses this is exactly what the Lord has done. The psalmist asks God to turn and now his enemies, he says, will be turned away. You see the reversal there? He is wrestling with how long all this has been going on only to have his foes turned away, turned back in sudden disgrace. Again, you see the reversal. He says, look how long this is all taking place. And then suddenly there's an answer. Suddenly there's a reversal. What a change that has taken place between verse 7 and verse 10. Again, we don't know what's happened, but something definitely happened because everything has been reversed for, for for this psalmist. We only need to use our imaginations for a moment to picture the, the, the psalmist's change of posture and countenance. He must have gone from one who is bent over and worn out by so much grief to one who is standing tall and confident in God's deliverance. Instead of being beaten down by the, the lies of the enemy, He's declaring now the salvation and the power of his God. And if that's the writer's experience, it can be ours as well. Remember, these things were written for our benefit. They were written for our education. They were written so that we ourselves might pray this very prayer and and move through these stages to see God's deliverance in our lives. Let me ask you this morning, where are you in this psalm? Where are you in this psalm? Maybe you're at the beginning where you're uncertain about what God is up to in your life, and maybe you're not enjoying it right now. 
maybe this whole pandemic has caused great uh, uh, consternation uh, in your spirit. And you're wondering, God, what are you doing? Do you even know what you're doing? Or are you doing anything at all? Are you uncertain about what God's up to in your life? Have you been calling out to him for, for healing in this season and perplexed about how long it's taking? Why, Lord? Why, long, why, is, why now? Why all these things? I'm tired of it. I want it to be over. Maybe you find yourself in that place where your, your strength is ebbing away with way too much sorrow and way too many tears. You don't know what to do with all the emotion. Does it feel like your enemies are winning? And whether they're winning on the physical front or the emotional front or the, or the mental front or the spiritual front, all these things are battlegrounds for you and you don't believe you're winning at all, that the enemy has the, the upper hand. Or maybe you're at the end of the psalm, you're in a place of victory, celebrating God's work of turning things around for you or around for someone you care about and been praying for. You're seeing God's deliverance. You are experiencing your, his healing in your life and you're celebrating that. Where are you today in this psalm? I bet to be, if we were all honest, uh, many of us are in a mix of all of these places all at once. Some are at the beginning, uh, and some are in the middle, and some are at the end in, in all kinds of different areas of our lives. Some places, some areas of our life, we are experiencing victory, but some places of our life still bring us tears. Some places of our lives are still bringing us to that place of confusion and unrest. Why is it like that? Why, is our, why are our lives like that? Well, it's because we live in a, we live in a broken world. You'll notice that the psalmist doesn't ask for forgiveness in this passage. That's key. Why doesn't he ask for forgiveness? Because he hasn't done nothing wrong. It's the nature of our world that these struggles are going to take place. All these things happen around us and happen to him because they're common to all of us. Again, it's the nature of living in a broken world where sin still has sway, where the enemy still has sway. That day will someday we ultimately be reversed when Jesus returns or we go uh, to glory, that, that will be reversed to us. But even though it is true that this world is a mess and, this, and that we are caught up in that mess and we struggle in that mess and some, some days we are, are overrun with, with emotion and challenges and difficulties and we wonder how, it all, how we're going to carry on. But the good news is, and the psalmist confesses to this, that God is in the midst of it all. God's in the midst of our confusion. He's in the midst of our cries for help. He's there. You know, if the Bible says that God knows the, the very number of hairs on our head, I'm sure he counts our tears. He knows that. He's familiar with our sorrows. He's been tempted as we have been tempted and is sympathetic and familiar with our weakness. God is in the midst of the strength. And yes, it's great to stand on the mountaintop and proclaim God's deliverance and speak to our enemy and see him suddenly disappear and that body restored or that relationship or that or the financial need be met. It's wonderful to to, uh, to declare those things. but And he's in those things for sure. And we need to have more faith for more of those things. But he's also in the challenging time. Challenging time. He's also in the lament. He's also there in the brokenness because he knows what that is like. And that's the good news of this psalm. Wherever you are in this psalm, you can meet the Lord. Wherever you are in this psalm, you can look forward to the victory that is already ours. We may not have appropriated all of it, but it is ours today. So call on him. He will share your struggle. Tell your enemies where to go in his power of his name, but wait on his answer. His love is on our side. The rescuer is by your side. Continue, even in sorrow, continue to look for his victory. Look 
for the answer. Your salvation, friends, is drawing nigh. It's right around uh, the corner. Now is not the time uh, to give up. Now is not the time to switch sides. Find yourself on the side of the Lord. He will be with you. He will strengthen you. He will, you will find your, your needs met because your life is under that umbrella of loving kindness. His loyal love will not leave you unfixed. It will not leave you in that place of despair. He will dry every tear. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for what we learn uh, through your dealing with these saints from so long ago. Thank you, Lord, that we see in this life the power of relying on you and the promise of change that is coming. And Lord, I just pray for each and every one listening today, wherever they are and whenever they are seeing this, that you would be speaking by your Holy Spirit and drawing them to yourself to know that they too, through faith, can be one of your beloved and the victory is theirs. No matter what they're going through, there is a turnaround on the horizon. May we wait for it. May we call it forth. May we declare it over our lives until we see with our own eyes the salvation of our God. Come and bring comfort. Come and bring strength. Come and bring a renewal and a reversal to our fortunes, Lord. And we pray even in the midst of this pandemic it is, as it is wearing on and it is wearing us down, Lord, may we arise in you today to be honest about how we're doing, but Lord, and give that over to you and find you in the midst of it all. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your love and your faithfulness, for your kindness and your mercy. May they be new to us every morning. This we pray in the powerful name of King Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, God bless you. I pray that he keeps you. I pray that his face shines upon you. I pray that he gives you his peace. God bless and see you next time.